Uh, my name is Paul Salem. I am the president of the Middle East Institute, and it gives, gives me great pleasure to welcome you all today to our conference focusing on the Horn of Africa. Conference title is Migration, Investment, and Competition, the Middle East and the Horn of Africa. Uh, obviously, the countries of the Horn are going and have been going through their own challenges of uh, unrest, governance challenges, uh, uh, civil society issues, economic development issues. Also, the Horn of Africa has become uh, an arena of competition uh, for regional powers, partly from the Gulf and uh, further away. Uh, also, increasingly, an arena for great power or global power competition. And the Horn of Africa is very much affected also by uh, refugee flows, by security conditions in the Middle East that spill over into the Horn or the Horn spilling over into other parts of the Middle East. In today's conference, uh, we hope to examine ways in which the Horn remains a vital region to watch through various lenses of, of governance, democratization, uh, food insecurity, civil society, regional competition, global competition. Uh, our program today will have two panels. Uh, the first panel will focus on humanitarian and security challenges. The second panel will focus on key regional players and competition in the Horn of Africa. Uh, for the first panel today, uh, moderating that panel is Ms. Salem, uh, Salem Solomon. Uh, sh we share a last name and a first name, uh, uh, so uh, happy that uh, Ms. Solomon is here. She is a multimedia digital journalist with the Voice of America's Africa Division. She covers latest news from the continent and also reports and, and, and edits in Amharic and Tigrigna. Before I turn it over to Ms. Solomon, I want to remind everyone that this conversation is being uh, recorded uh, for our website, so please silence your mobile phones. But we do encourage tweeting, uh, and if you do tweet, please use the hashtag MEIAfrica. We're also pleased to announce that this conference is being broadcast on C-SPAN 3, and thanks to C-SPAN for being here. Uh, I very much want to thank our colleagues at Garda World, uh, who have made this uh, conference possible. Thanks for their support. Uh, thanks to Mr. Pete Dordle, who wasn't able to be with us today, uh, but representing Garda World uh, as a senior vice president, my, Mr. Michael O'Connell. Thank you, Michael, for being with us today. Uh, with that, uh, please join me in uh, welcoming uh, Salim, and uh, she will introduce the panel and get us started. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we're mic'd up. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, coming to join us here today. Thank you for, uh, to the Middle East uh, Institute for organizing this. And uh, thank you to uh, National Press Club to, uh, for hosting this. Um, as uh, we briefly mentioned, my name is Salam Solomon. I am uh, uh, a journalist with The Voice of America. Uh, I hail from Eritrea, an East African country and uh, was born in Ethiopia, so <laughs> I cover the, the continent plus the region. Um, I would like to start with uh, a little bit of uh, an overview in the past 12 months. Uh, you know, there, there's been a, a lot of remarkable changes in the Horn of Africa. Um, in September, September 2018, uh, Eritrea and Ethiopia signed a, a peace deal, um, a historic peace deal, uh, bringing an end to a two-decade uh, war, hostility, and reopened a shared border that has changed in a couple of weeks. The borders are closed again. Uh, but the deal has allowed families to reunite and opened a way for commercial activity between the two countries, even though limited uh, at the moment. At the same time, Ethiopia, under the leadership of Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, uh, has instituted a, a, a number of reforms, including liberation of political spaces, uh, prisoners, and opening up space for freedom of uh, press and freedom of expression, making Ethiopia, uh, there, is no, there are no journalists jailed in the country uh, as we speak. Djibouti, on the other hand, has um, 
continue to cement its role as a geostrategically important location as global powers, including the United States, uh, Japan, France, and uh, China build military footprint. Uh, but Djibouti has also grappled with negative side of, the, uh, of uh, partnering with foreign powers. China has financed uh, construction, including port, railway, water, and energy facilities, a $3.5 billion free trade zone we've seen uh, covered in the past uh, couple of uh, uh, months and, uh, and years. Uh, although many uh, in Djibouti celebrated the investment that is coming from foreign uh, powers, uh, the nation is now has taken uh, public debt uh, equivalent to 88% of its uh, gross domestic product. And so uh, some are warning about debt uh, trap and how that could uh, result in China taking over and influencing its foreign policy. So things to think about when we explore these uh, uh, issues that we're going to be talking about. Somalia, as has been uh, the case for years, experience uh, a mixture of positive and negative uh, developments. And uh, there are reasons for optimism in the past couple of uh, uh, months, including a, a reopening of the U.S. Embassy uh, in Mogadishu, uh, but violence and instability uh, continue uh, to haunt the country. Al-Shabaab is um, showing its ability to launch deadly attacks um, both inside the country and in neighboring Kenya, as you saw earlier this year. And uh, although Al-Shabaab's uh, strength has been decim uh, decimated by the efforts of Amazon, and uh, U.S.'s precision strikes, uh, extremist groups uh, uh, aligned with, with this group uh, exert their control over uh, outlying areas um, in the country and maintain sources of uh, funding from the places that they control by tax collection, uh, charcoal trafficking, and uh, wildlife products. So we are today fortunate enough to have all uh, uh, you know, a panel of experts who uh, have extensive experience in studying specific countries and the region as a whole. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and uh, introduce uh, Yosef uh, Badwaza, is uh, a senior program officer covering Africa for Freedom House. Uh, Bronwyn Bouton is the deputy uh, director at the Atlantic Council's uh, Africa Center. And uh, Ambassador uh, Makila James is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for East Africa uh, and Sudan so at the State Department. And uh, Susan uh, Signet is the Africa Director at the United States Institute of Peace. Thank you so much for joining us today to discuss these pressing issues. Uh, we will try to explore these uh, regional dynamics and what these mean and we look, as we look ahead. I would like to start with Ambassador James, uh, <laughs> if that's okay. <laughs> All right, um, sure. and so the U.S. has uh, an only permanent uh, military base in the African continent, Camp uh, Lemonnier, uh, located in Djibouti, and it's also viewed as a vital military and economic uh, partner with Ethiopia, um, and has played an important uh, role in combating uh, extremism in Somalia as well. So. My first question to you is, how would you assess the U.S. presence in the Horn, and how do you see it changing in foreseeable future? Okay, thank you, Salam. First of all, welcome to everybody. I'm glad to be here. It's a pleasure to get out of the building for a couple of hours, so thank you all very much for that. Um, my portfolio covers um, 13 countries, um, so I have all of the Horn countries, so I have all of the countries along the Red Sea. I have Sudan, Ethiopia, South Sudan. It's a very exciting, interesting portfolio. And despite the fact that we're going to talk about some of the concerning issues, there's a lot of positive stuff going on in East Africa as well. I'll walk through the neighborhood very quickly just so you can get a sense of what we see as the highlights in the neighborhood that we're focused on. Starting with Somalia, I would say we're probably in a guardedly optimistic mindset about Somalia because we've seen where it was in 1991 and we now have our permanent presence there. We have, um, and a, and a, we have one of our most senior diplomats there, Ambassador Don Yamamoto, and we have recommitted to not only addressing the military and security threat, but we're also working very aggressively on political issues and economic issues. So in Somalia, there's a lot of positiveness along with the concerns we've been working on for the last three decades. For the last three decades, it has been a great concern for us because of the terrorist threat in the area, but we have seen some modest degrees of progress with Amazon. The African Union mission there has been working more closely in the last few months, I would say, with the Somali National Army to move outside of just Mogadishu. 
And so now we're trying to push the security perimeter further out. That's been some of the good news. It's not been without consequence and without cost, but it is essential that we get beyond just Mogadishu. So that's been happening, and that's been a bit of a, a, a positive news story that we are now seeing um, the Somali National Army, the SNA, holding territory, taking and holding territory outside of Mogadishu proper. That's one good bit of news. The second good news is that um, we are encouraging the government, the federal government, to work more closely with the member states. That's been a great concern. This is a very interesting federal project they have underway, and it has not been without a lot of bumps. There have been some elections that have been rather complicated. There are more elections coming. But we've been maintaining with the government, the federal government, they must work with the member states. So they, I think, are now much more poised than ever before to work more collaboratively to make sure the elections that are coming up go on smoothly and that there is that local autonomy as they build the federal national structure. Um, on the humanitarian front, there is still a grave, grave humanitarian crisis. I could not undersell that at all. And the numbers that we're looking at, the US government has been the largest supplier in Somalia for the last decade, I would so decade, I would say. And certainly in this year, we've been putting in huge numbers of humanitarian assistance. 753 million is our current foreign assistance budget that includes humanitarian, some economic development assistance, and a lot of security assistance. It's a huge amount of money for one country, but we're doing it because it's so important that Somalia be stabilized because we see a lot of other positive things happening in the region. Somalia cannot continue to be that gap, that area of instability in what's an otherwise interesting, improving neighborhood. Um, on the economic front, I would say we're focusing on integration of the region. We're trying to help those efforts around regional integration. And to that extent, I'll move along quickly to talk about where else we're working. We're working very heavily, of course, with the Ethiopian government. You mentioned Prime Minister Abi. He has been an amazing visionary leader who has changed the dynamics in the whole region. Through Prime Minister Abi's office, he's also been engaging with Somalia, with Eritrea, with Djibouti. He is helping to bring this political and economic integration, and we have been fully supportive of that effort. We are trying very hard to be sure that Prime Minister Abiy's government is strong and that it, that it stays, and that they have successful elections next year. So Ethiopia has been the good news story that's helping on the Somali front as well. Um, I'll just touch briefly on a few things, because I know there's probably a lot more questions to be had. Djibouti, on Djibouti, as you mentioned, we have a large military base there. But Djibouti, again, is not only about military involvement and security assistance. It is about more regional integration. Um, Djibouti also would like to have better relationships with its neighbors. We're trying to help with the relationship between Eritrea and Djibouti, long contentious. They've had a long border war. We have lifted to the UN sanctions on Eritrea, and we've used that leverage to urge the parties to talk more, try to resolve their border issues, try to be better neighbors, because there's great potential for a lot more inter, uh, integrated economic activity if all the countries are operating more collaboratively. So Djibouti, we have a lot of focus as well, not only on the military side, but on this, this neighborhood building and in economic integration project. Um, the other country I would touch on very briefly is maybe just say a little bit more about Eritrea. Eritrea is a fascinating country. If you all are so lucky to get to go there, it's really worth going to see. For the longest time, our relationship with Eritrea has been rather distant, rather, um, we call it correct. We've always had diplomatic relationships, but it wasn't quite um, the way we want it to be. In the last couple of years, starting with then Ambassador Don Yamamoto when he was the Assistant Secretary, he traveled to Eritrea um, in 17. Last year, my current boss, Assistant Secretary Tibor Naj, traveled to Eritrea, and I traveled myself in December. All of those meetings were very important because it began to start a dialogue with the Eritrean government that we've long wanted to resume if they were willing to have it, and we were able to have a constructive dialogue about a number of things. Eritrea is, of course, concerned about the rapprochement in the region that will maybe leave them out if they see so much effort on Eritrea, whether in Ethiopia and in Djibouti and in Somalia. It was our conscious decision to make sure that we were reaching out to Eritrea as well, to say it's important that Eritrea not be left out. Eritrea needs to be a part of this regional integration politically and economically. So we went there to have some conversations. They still have a long way to go. The government's mindset has not shifted overnight. Um, Prime Minister Abiy's outreach has been made, and they've sort of reached back, but they still have some challenges, particularly on this issue of national service, the mandatory service that all young people have to go through that prevents people from traveling, from picking their own career paths, from being able to leave the country. All of those are very big challenges. 
those are issues along with human rights issues. And so we're engaged with the Eritreans, but it's a constructive conversation. They want a more, um, they want a more positive conversation with the United States. We are open to it. We want to talk about some of the tough things. We've got people there that are still under um, arrest that we have not been able to get a firm answer on. We don't stop having the tough human rights conversations, but we want to have a conversation about bringing them into the 21st century, joining an integrated region, helping them move forward. They've got serious economic issues as well in Eritrea. They've got a serious banking crisis. So they have a reason to want to be more involved with the international community. So we're open to having that and trying to help them find their way into the broader community. So those are the priorities that we have right now in East Africa. I'll save Sudan for another panel, but I also work on Sudan. And of course, it's part of the region. If anybody wants to engage on that, we can do that maybe offline. But I would say Somalia, guardedly optimistic. Djibouti, we want to go just, we, we want to look at how we help them um, become a more um, integrated regional economic partner. Um, we also have the Chinese presence there. Didn't even want to go into that yet, but we are very much concerned about our military presence there with neighbors who operate very differently as a military presence. So that's another concern we have in Djibouti. But, but for the most part, we are seeing positive signs with this rejuvenation in the East Africa region. A lot of credit we give to Prime Minister Abiy. He's been the glue for a lot of the countries in the contentious conversations. But I'd say the trajectory is going in a more positive direction than the other way. Very optimistic is what you're saying. I would like to bring in, thank you for, so much for that overview. I'd like to bring in Suzanne, uh, Susan uh, about uh, you know, leadership. You talked about leadership and the role of leadership. I think it's fair to say none of these countries that you've mentioned, be it Somalia, Eritrea, Ethiopia, um, in the region would be categorized or defined as fully functional democracies. We can agree, all agree on that. But several have been ruled by one party or even um, open, maybe one person uh, for two decades or more, case of Eritrea. Um, and the case of Somalia, seeds of multi-party democracy are just beginning to be planted from what we are seeing so far. So could you give us an overview of uh, the state of democratic institutions and civil society in, in the region? Sure. I when, when I was thinking about the, the conversation and the notion of talking about democratization and peace building, I sort of went back to what are the definitions for that. And fundamentally, that is about being able to find nonviolent ways to resolve conflict, to build a social contract between those who govern and those who are governed, a belief that governments will actually deliver to all of their citizens. Um, and that's based on trust, performance, legitimacy, and credibility. And, and it just strikes me that in these moments of incredibly complex transitions, remembering that there isn't agreement on what the conflict or the conflicts are, there isn't agreement in many cases about what the vision will ultimately be, and there isn't an agreement about how the countries will come together to reach that ultimate vision um, and what the, what the roadmap or what the, the process looks like for people to define what their priorities are and how they will be governed together. So I, I don't, I'm not going to go through sort of the, the strict statistics in terms of where democracy and freedom are. I think my colleague will, will speak mm -hmm. to some of, some of those, those aspects, but I think it's worth thinking about these issues as being multi-level. Um, we know that there are serious conflicts, there is violence happening at a local level, at a community level, in all of the countries that we've talked about. We know that there are fundamental questions about what, what does the future of the state look like and how will it be governed? Um, and I think if we look at Ethiopia at the moment, it's, it's a really striking example of the complexity of a transition. Um, Indeed, there's a leader who has articulated a vision to take forward, um, but there are fundamental questions about how the state will change um, or whether the state will change in response to the massive social and political reforms that are taking place. And, and to date, there, there isn't a clear roadmap about what, what those steps will look like. Um, and part of that is because there are some questions that are so deeply polarizing that it's quite difficult to map out what decisions will be made when. Um, and so I think this is, this is one of the, the very challenging pieces that, that have to be pulled together. Um, I, was, I was recently um, in Ethiopia and was in Bahardar in the Amhara region and was talking to young people who have been involved in dialogue 
dialogue programs in the universities for, for the past decade. Um, and these are designed to take the, the young students who are brought together from across the country and help them to figure out how to deal with the conflicts that arise because they've grown up in different places, they're going to school in the same location, and they're experiencing and seeing all of the divides that characterize the, the big questions that are in front of the state at this incredibly exciting moment um, and how to take that forward. Um, I think the question of democracy and peace building, it also raises a fundamental issue about do we have the right tools and the right structures in place to be able to manage this, this type of change. What happens in one country directly affects what's happening in another country. It affects the national government, it affects the state level governments, and it affects the communities. And I think this is where it ties to this question of the role, the, the interaction between the Gulf and the Horn. Um, and people like Ambassador James are, are fantastically paying attention to these, these dynamics increasingly. But within the US government and within most governments, there isn't a structure to look at the connections between this, this seam of the Red Sea that we somehow think is the end of Africa and the beginning of, of the Gulf. But in fact, the political, economic, security, peace ideas that flow across fundamentally shape what's happening in each country. So Somalia is a great visible example of that. Um, I'm gonna put Sudan on the table because I think mm -hmm. we see right now that what's happening in Sudan, facts are being created on the ground by the way that Gulf states are engaging, by the way that they're engaging with people in the street, by the way they're engaging with the Transitional Military Council. Um, and one of the challenges in front of all of us is how do we wrap our arms around that in a way that gives the greatest chance to a civilian-led transition in that country. And that's, that's symbolic, I think, of the questions that are being faced in other locations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That leads up to uh, talk about human rights issues. Uh, you know, Yosef, I, I would like to come to you about, you know, protecting human rights and uh, constant, it's, it's a constant struggle in the region. We talked about Eritrea, for instance, you know, among the worst jailers of journalists, colleagues that we know. Uh, political dissidents, founders of the country are still in jail, 15 years plus. These are pressing human rights issues that we're talking about. Um, and Ethiopia has been celebrated in the past year because of opening up space like this. Um, one of the most mo moment, momentous, I think, uh, events that I remember is the closing of Kaliti prison, which was uh, seen as like, you know, uh, torture was a common place in, 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 this, in this center, and now it's closed. So how do you assess human rights in the region, and is there any reason for optimism, or is it a mixed bag? Uh, uh, thank you, Salim. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I, I think in, in terms of uh, uh, talking about protection of human rights across uh, the region, uh, a good lens uh, for that kind of conversation would be looking at uh, just a snapshot of uh, what has been happening over uh, the past year in terms of uh, how particularly the state in Ethiopia uh, is trying to uh, effect uh, the changes that are uh, uh, that, that are going to be uh, uh, executed in the coming uh, years. Uh, I think a common problem, a common issue for, for all uh, these countries in the region when we talk about human rights problem is uh, th that result of decades of uh, repressive rule and that brought about uh, severely weakened uh, institutions. Uh, if you take, for example, the challenges uh, that are being faced by the new administration in Ethiopia uh, in terms of uh, effecting uh, their vision is uh, trying to deal with uh, institutions that are so enmeshed with the party, the, the ruling party structures, uh, so that even effective day-to-day -day civil service work is closely uh, impacted by uh, political loyalty. So uh, trying to get uh, that addressed uh, in, in terms of streamlining the changes uh, to the ground level uh, is a challenge. I think another uh, cause is uh, due to the multi-ethnic nature of the communities in the region. Again, uh, talking about uh, Ethiopia, for example, uh, the, the biggest, one of the biggest challenges 
this government is now facing is uh, this communal and ethnic-based violence that is a result of this heightened uh, rhetoric about ethnic identity within the countries. And I think that resonates across uh, the regions when, where there are uh, um, overlapping identities. Uh, if you take Djibouti, the Afar Isaac uh, issue, if you take the Somali region uh, and Somalia uh, uh, next door, the conflicts and the nature, the dynamics uh, that is uh, affecting security and humanitarian issues in Ethiopia necessarily uh, overflows there and impacting uh, all uh, the, the countries there. I think uh, in terms of talking about decades of also uh, repressive rule, uh, there is this one party or one person, like Salem was saying, uh, rule that, that never allowed uh, any meaningful uh, critic and opposition uh, in, in employing a number of uh, repressive policies and rules. Uh, and when a transition like the, the one in Ethiopia opens up, uh, trying to have all these interests accommodated is, is becoming a challenge. For example, now threatening even uh, the, the the one's really strong ruling party, the Ethiopian People's uh, Revolutionary Democratic Party, which in, in many places I see that being credited for bringing or being willing to undertake this, these reforms. But I think uh, in terms of, uh, again, talking about the decades of repressive rule that this party uh, instituted, the problem is coming back uh, to haunt it when it tries to reform itself uh, in a way that different units of the party uh, trying to uh, benefit from uh, fueling uh, ethnic and uh, community violence uh, to get some sort of leverage over federal authorities so that they can have a stronger position when it comes to uh, dividing power once this transition is completed. So uh, in all these uh, efforts, uh, I, I think uh, that the, the human rights uh, arena suffers, uh, particularly uh, when, when it comes to, uh, for example, ensuring security of people. Uh, Ethiopia has become one of uh, the largest, having the largest number of internally displaced people since this transition has started. So th th there is a huge uh, humanitarian crisis that the government is trying to address while trying at the same time also to be uh, a meaningful uh, player uh, in the region. I, I think it's fair to say uh, a failure uh, in Ethiopia's democratic experiment would have uh, significant uh, implications uh, to, to, the, to the region both in terms of the humanitarian challenge, uh, in terms of food security, and in terms of even ensuring uh, uh, human rights. It, just uh, as an example, if you take the, the Ethiopian-Eritrean peace process now, uh, th there is uh, increasing stories coming out about the process being stalled because of the inherent, uh, 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 in part, mistress that, that characterize this relationship in the first place. And it, there is a lot of uh, information not being communicated to the community so that they could become uh, a meaningful part of the process. So the border closings, so Eritreans uh, increasing uh, suspicion about uh, TPLF hands uh, instigating uh, dissidents in, inside Eritrea and, and also uh, the concern about the number of Eritreans that are going into Ethiopia uh, as a result of the opening of uh, the, the normalization of relationship has become a concern and there has not been any meaningful progress uh, in the past recent months uh, in the peace process. So I'll stop here. So there's a lot of uh, components here to unpack, it seems like migration, security, but I would like to also get your perspective, maybe Brownwood could uh, um, 
give us an overview about, you know, as these internal uh, dynamics are unfolding, uh, the region has been a long competitive space for foreign powers. And, uh, and it's, no, it's not different today. And you see the competitive military interests in Djibouti. It's very saturated there. Uh, I wonder, is this a source of stability or instability in the region? And also, does this, uh, the presence of foreign powers, uh, large companies and interests with vast resources, is this undermining the local uh, authority that uh, Yusuf was just explaining? Yeah, um, thank you very much, Salam. Um, it, as the other panelists have made very perfectly clear, it's a very complicated picture in the Horn of Africa right now. Um, for a long time, there's been almost a stasis in the Horn. Um, we've had, uh, uh, as you pointed out, a couple of countries that have been very stable dictatorships, Eritrea and Djibouti. And for a long time, Ethiopia felt like a stable dictatorship too. But with that transition, it's now on the verge of becoming a democracy. And we all know that the transition from authoritarianism to democracy is a perilous one. Um, Ethiopia basically was ruled by the TPLF for a long time, and they implemented a system of ethnic segregation, which caused a lot of animosity between the various tribes of Ethiopia. And now that the Iron Fist has been lifted, people are taking the opportunity to revisit old grudges. Um, and you're seeing an explosion of conflict across the country as a result. It is unclear to me, absolutely unclear, whether the transition is going to be a successful one. Um, I would describe it as a coin toss, frankly. I think it could easily go either way. And I think that the spread of humanitarian crisis in Somalia and in parts of Ethiopia really makes this transition more difficult than it would otherwise be. I think we can't forget that this is a part of the continent that not only has political problems, it has very, very real climate change concerns and drought um, that affect the political situation as well. And I do think that we tend to underplay that when we have these talks. Um, another very complicating factor is, as you say, the militarization of the Horn of Africa. And I do want to be clear here that the militarization has taken place for a long time. And it's primarily been driven by the United States. Um, the United States has bankrolled the flooding of Somalia with tens of thousands of foreign soldiers. Obviously, the United States has a massive military installation in Djibouti. And so when we talk about the, the problematic nature of militarizing the Horn, we have to point out it's only become problematic since other actors started doing it. Um, really, it's the United States that has, has been the, the driver of this development. Um, it's, again, very difficult to tell how this will affect the countries of the Horn. I am personally inclined to be optimistic about it. Um, I personally think that the, the entrance of the Gulf states uh, into the politics of the Horn of Africa is likely to be fruitful because of the very long commercial ties between the Gulf and the Horn of Africa and the fact that they are now deeply embedded in the politics of the region. Unlike the United States, um, and um, obviously I don't represent the government, so I can say this. I, I've been a long observer of US policy in the Horn of Africa, and I've often felt that it's kind of like a science experiment for us, because Africa feels so distant. And particularly in the case of Somalia, what that's meant is that the US has been very cavalier about how we've implemented our policies. Um, backing Ethiopia's invasion of Somalia, for example, was an immensely rash thing to do. And I doubt very much that we would have taken a course of action like that if we had skin in the game. Um, it, because Somalia, in particular, feels so far away, we've been able to address it with a brutality that I think, again, we wouldn't use to a closer neighbor. And I have to say that the Gulf states, because they are likely to feel the consequences of any instability in the Horn, are likely to act with a little bit more caution than the United States has used in the past. Um, for me, the, this is all, therefore, uh, something to be celebrated. But I do think that the fact that the, so much of the investment that's heading into the Horn of Africa is military in nature as opposed to commercial is a source of concern. And I would say that ultimately what's going to determine whether or not this interest is productive for the citizens of the Horn really comes down to whether Eritrea, Ethiopia, Djibouti, and Somalia can come together to be the leaders. If they allow the Gulf states 
Turkey, Iran, China, Japan, Russia, all of these countries that are rushing into the horn to set the agenda, then obviously their interests are not going to be the ones that are being served. And so again, I think one of the most positive developments that we've seen is the rise of Dr. Abi in Ethiopia, because he really has been spearheading what has to be called a diplomatic renaissance in the Horn of Africa. And if there is anyone who is positioned to lead um, and to create a coherent sort of regional approach to these new actors, it's probably him. Um, the pressing question is whether the domestic situation in Ethiopia is going to allow him to spend time on that regional role. Um, it, he's so overwhelmed with things to do that every decision he makes, there's an opportunity cost that can be quite catastrophic. Mm -hmm. um, and the last thing I want to say in clothing is that we need to understand that this moment in Ethiopia, although it does appear rosy on the surface, is actually the most perilous moment I've witnessed in the Horn of Africa in the 20 or so years that I've been researching it. Because the, the prospects for state collapse in Ethiopia are more real now than they have ever been before. Mm -hmm. um, many people have been predicting a genocide in Ethiopia, and it, that's been forestalled by Dr. Abi's rise. But if he fails, then I think anything essentially could happen. And if Ethiopia becomes unstable, then obviously that opens up the possibility of an arc of instability that goes from Somalia through Ethiopia. Presumably Eritrea would collapse, given the mathematical realities of the population sizes through Yemen, again, through to the Sahel. And that would be a crisis, I think, of unprecedented proportions, not only for the Gulf states, but for Europe and ultimately for the United States as well. Mm. You make a very good point about the ethnic tension that I'd like to come back. But since you appointed US's involvement and heavy involvement in, in the region plays a really important part, I would like to toss the next question to Ambassador James. Uh, about uh, you know the reopening of the U.S. Uh, um, embassy in Somalia it was I mean just as it was a celebration that Abi has come uh, I mean has has reformed a lot of uh, developments in the region the reopening of it is also celebrated I think uh, in the country um, <coughs> could you share a bit about what the U.S. is doing to partner with the Somali government as is right now? and security forces, the civil society there, and um, how can the US help the country return into some, some sort of degree of semblance and peace and unity? Okay, thank you for the question, and I'd like to respond to my colleague. Um, let me respond to the biggest point that you made, which is that we are militarizing the region. Looking at Somalia, Somalia's had three decades, if not longer, of instability, and they are indeed a security threat to themselves, to the region, to the continent, and ultimately to the United States as well. What we've been focusing on is not just the security issue, but really what's the root cause. The root cause is economic. All these unemployed young people across the entire region, 70% in some countries, under 30, these people who don't have jobs, young people who don't have a guaranteed future, a plan for themselves. So we can't even afford to even be focused on the security if we wanted to. We have to have a much broader approach if we really want to address what's driving the insecurity. So our program is by nature multifaceted. We do have a program that looks at creating more space to allow economic development, economic assistance to come in. We have a, for the first time since 1991, we've opened up our embassy again. I guess it was maybe like December, January, we reopened the embassy. So we have an ambassador there, we have political officers there, we have economic aid officers coming in on a regular basis. We'd like to get our USAID director relocated to Mogadishu. That is our long-term planning, and that's simply limited by space and security conditions for the people that are there. But we certainly have aid people coming over regularly, weekly, daily, and they are moving out small with small projects because the goal is to start showing at the community level some sense of economic opportunity. We're looking at the areas that are most potentially beneficial, agricultural, fishing work. Um, we're trying to think about the things that will begin to give hope at the community level to get more buy-in for stability in those areas. But you cannot do that if you do not open up the security corridors more. You have to connect roads, you have to connect cities, people have to be able to move around, and that's why it appears to be such an overly heavy security focus, but that is essential to open up any kind of commercial opportunities. So that's the Somalia case. But I would say across the region, we're equally concerned about that in Ethiopia. You made an excellent point about the insecurity in Ethiopia, the lack of institutions for Dr. Abe to work through. He has not inherited that system. 
we have just hosted on Friday a huge program at State Department to focus on business opportunities in Ethiopia. We had 400 people we invited, business people, to look at private sector investment. And we know that that is going up against the grain of people who don't have quite that same mentality in the ministries to absorb what we're trying to push. They don't quite have the banking system, the foreign currency. So to work in a country like Ethiopia, which has the right leadership, we're still coming up against the security threat from people who want to be spoilers, who don't want to see this new kind of government succeed. We're working up against the, the, um, the mindset so long of a state-led economy. That's a challenge. And so we're finding that you have to keep your eye on the security ball, but you cannot ever, ever take your eye off the economic ball because at the end of the day, it's about giving these young people a sense of a new direction, a new way to, to live. And so we have a multifaceted program. It's not as pronounced in, say, a Somalia, because in Somalia, the biggest threat is basically al-Shabaab. They are a threat to the region. If they are continued, the Doucet Hotel attack in Kenya reminds us that they still have extraterritorial um, abilities, and we cannot take our eye off that security threat. Um, you also made a point I wanted to just come back to about the level of US focus and commitment in this region. Um, I'm not going to debate that heavily because I'd say, yes, I, as a person who works on Africa, I'd like to see us have more focus and more attention there. But we do have a lot of focus because it's not only destabilizing to Somalia, which as you say, many Americans might find it hard to find on the map and understand why we're in Somalia, but it's affecting Kenya. It affects all the neighboring countries. And so what goes on in Somalia spills over. And we do care about this entire region because some of the countries were very high performing and doing well, but the insecurity from al-Shabaab threatens their economic survival as well. Mm -hmm. So I would just push back to say that we see this as a regional conflict. We see these as regional problems. It's not just Somalia, which may be hard to find any day of the week on a map for Americans, but we care about the entire region because what happens there affects all of the neighboring states. Mm -hmm. um, so I would just say that we do have an economic agenda as well, and Somalia is slowly moving out. You see it very heavily in um, Ethiopia. And if we could do more in Eritrea, we would. Eritrea does not have a USAID presence, has not for decades. They disinvited USAID. USAID would probably be interested in going back to talk with them, at least about a program, but that requires some openness from the government. So these preliminary conversations are to lead the way towards more economic support, because an integrated economic region there is really the long-term stability for all of us at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. I would like to, uh, I mean, we touched on these subjects, but we, did, we, uh, we haven't addressed uh, the foreign, uh, foreign powers aspect of it, for instance. I, I don't mean to uh, give you another question back to back, but uh, I would like to hear your perspective on China's push to invest in East Africa and beyond. I think it's very important to, to, to look at that because when you're looking at a human rights, uh, if, if, there, if there are loans coming from a, a country that doesn't have a, uh, great human rights record, it's very important to, to have it in this discussion. Uh, I mean, from the trade zone, from military base, to uh, financing the African Union, the, the symbol of, uh, not Addis Ababa, but symbol of, 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 of the institution, uh, the standard ra gauge railway in Kenya. Uh, I mean, virtually, it's, a, it's impossible uh, to not name a country that the Chinese are not involved. So. Um, how is the U.S. trying to counterbalance Chinese influence in the Horn of Africa, and is the U.S. doing enough? I just came from a six-country, 10-day tour of East Africa. I'm exhausted. But it was <laughs> extremely eye-opening to this very point. I saw a Chinese presence from South Sudan to Mauritius, where I ended up, um, in ways that I had not seen in many, many, many years. And this is Chinese investment of a different kind from the kind we used to see in the old days when they would build a stadium or maybe a government building. This is multifaceted, and it's much more sophisticated, and it's with the welcome invitation of the host countries. So you ask me, how do we see it? We are talking to countries about how the US government does business to first of all make ourselves the more attractive partner. We say to countries, we say to governments, the way American companies do business is transparently, we have the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. We will not accept and tolerate bribery. We bring to the picture, we hope, good corporate social responsibility. And we think we've got a better product most of the time. So we try to, first of all, outsell that what we have to offer to governments, to, to um, the private sector in, in, China, in Africa, is better than what China offers. That's our first talking point. We don't 
try to trash talk the Chinese as much as up talk ourselves. We've got a better product and a better way we do business. But we do also say to governments, look at what China's investment brings. We either bring direct commercial investment by facilitating foreign direct investment, or we do grants, or we do more responsible lending. China's practices have, have in many cases, been predatory. A lot of the loans that have been given to countries in East Africa have ended up seriously indebting these governments. We do not think that is good for these countries, because then we end up having to finance health programs to our PEPFAR program. We end up supporting humanitarian assistance. We support a lot of IDP camps in the East Africa region. And so we are simply saying what makes sense for the United States government. We cannot watch you take on predatory lending from China and then ask the US government to come in and support social programs. So we're simply making the argument to them that these loans are not good. They have a lot more fine print, read the details. At the end of the day, countries will decide who their development partners are. We can't tell any country you cannot have China as a development partner. But we're trying to sell that we have a better product, a better way of doing business. And at the end of the day, we're not going to have you um, reach your debt ceiling over one or two projects. So that's the message we're giving. Um, beyond that, we think countries will make their own decisions. I will say I observed a difference in how governments feel versus how the public feels. The public may have a lot more criticism about why are we doing everything with China when some of the products aren't so good and we'd much rather have American businesses here. The governments don't quite take that same overtly critical impression, but they will certainly tell you behind closed doors that we are now saddled with a lot of debt, and it means we can't take on other debt, good debt, debt that would advance our economies because we've got all this old debt that's, that's not so good. So there's a, a conversation going on and a realization that's coming we can't be heavy handed about it. We simply have to point out our comparative advantages and hope that people will see at the end of the day, isn't it better to have a Bechtel build, building your roads, a US pharmaceutical company producing your products than to have a company whose reputation is not quite of the same level. Um, just on the Gulf states, I'll simply say that I share the comments made by my colleagues that we, we see the Gulf as having the ability to play a constructive role. But again, we would have to be honest and point out where um, we don't want to see Gulf conflicts come to the African continent, and that's what's playing out in some countries as well. And part of the reason why I'm uh, thinking about foreign uh, powers involvement, be it the Gulf or beyond, is because with that comes human rights issues. You know, exactly. those in initiatives that you are uh, striking with these Af African governments, how do you make sure that human rights are respected. So Yosef, just coming back to you about, um, you know, you, you talked about ethnic tension. Uh, I can remember for as long as uh, I've uh, covered Ethiopia, I've never seen the ethnic tension as, as uh, uh, tense as it is right now, and I think you might agree with me on this. But so I'd like to get your uh, perspective on outside groups, you know, be it Freedom House and other uh, outside groups that are working for greater human rights and accountability in, in places like Ethiopia, Djibouti, Eritrea. Um, how, what do you think the role of outside groups and foreign governments uh, should be in, in advancing uh, human rights in the Horn of Africa? Uh, I, I think, first of all, it, it's, it's naturally tempting when, for example, you see uh, openings as, such as in Ethiopia to just uh, go support it and be 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 a part of it, but I, I, th that uh, on its own, I think it's noble. But uh, in in terms of making sure that uh, this support is right, real, well informed, uh, strategic, and judicious, uh, most importantly, uh, are critical. Uh, I, I think the 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 long held uh, notion of do no harm. Uh, cannot be uh, overemphasized in, in, in terms of uh, uh, there is a need uh, to support these reform initiatives, be it at the government level or civil society and non-state actors. But I think, uh, especially uh, in this time, uh, in this particular time, there is a need uh, to make sure that uh, initiatives are uh, locally led. Uh, and in, in terms of uh, expressing solidarity, not just the material uh, support, support of it, but in terms of being uh, an automatic ally for transparency, for democratic governance, for uh, respect for human rights, the international community 
is not, I would say, supposed to be taking those for granted. For example, non-state non actor, civil society, uh, should not be expected to take this support as, as a, a naturally welcoming thing to, to receive, particularly in, in light of what has been going on in the past uh, two decades, for example. There have been uh, an overemphasis of the support being on, uh, on security and counterterrorism efforts, so that automatically created the perception and uh, to some extent the reality that uh, international support, particularly when it comes to the West, is automatically geared towards uh, supporting uh, the government uh, versus uh, being an ally to the, the democratic voices, dissidents uh, in the country, and that really uh, created this trust deficit uh, on the part of uh, particularly civil society. So when it comes to uh, uh, recalibrating that support and trying to re-engage uh, uh, democratic human rights actors in countries like Ethiopia, uh, there is a need to re-examine uh, the nature of past interventions and I think take uh, a couple of lessons uh, from that. Uh, in, in terms of areas, I think, apart from publicly uh, speaking out uh, on government excesses, I think uh, there is also a need to ensure uh, that the support addresses particularly issues of accountability uh, for uh, human rights abuses, supporting uh, local initiatives uh, that are uh, aiming to address these uh, truths telling and reconciliation efforts, uh, and also uh, supporting regional uh, human rights mechanisms such as uh, the African Commission and other sub-regional uh, bodies in terms of uh, uh, ensuring accountability. I'm saying this because uh, one of the, the, the issues that are trying to sort of derail uh, the reform efforts in Ethiopia is this big question of uh, ensuring accountability for past abuses. So uh, 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 parallel with supporting the strengthening of institution, parallel with supporting uh, the government to actually be able to get that time, manage the massive expectations and uh, uh, deliver on its promises, I think there is also uh, this need to ensure that accountability uh, for past uh, abuses have been addressed and abusers are uh, held to account. So. Mm -hmm. uh, speaking of accountability, uh, actually, uh, when Susan uh, earlier when we were talking about you know the Horn of Africa, we we're talking about how Sudan is not included in the conversation. But in terms of security and regional uh, dynamics, I think it's important to raise what's happening in Sudan right now. Uh, Sudan uh, and Sudan popular uprisings because of a massive expectation not delivering. Uh, we, we, we're seeing what's happening in Sudan and Algeria. Um, they've toppled, uh, you know, two long-serving leaders. Uh, and so, do you see uh, this movement spreading to the Horn, uh, particularly in places like, you know, my home country, Eritrea, for instance, uh, which seems very insulated? and uh, for many kind of mass protests or uh, movements against the ruling regime right now. Do you see any of that happening in the region, specifically in the Horn? Some people were, were joking when I was in Ethiopia recently that this is the Nile Spring that's, um, <laughs> that's coming forward. Um, I, you know, I think if we look at Sudan at this moment, um, this, the protests that started in December have been fairly well covered and visible, um, but this has been built up over years and years. I mean, at the very least, looking back to 2013 when there were protests and, and terrible attacks by security forces against those protesters, and there has been consistent, deliberate organizing that's taken place to rebuild, rebuild the, the trade unions, 
rebuild the doctors' unions as, as a nucleus that could help to organize the people um, towards nonviolent action. And so I think if we were to try to assess the, the possibility of that in Eritrea, I think we'd have to look and understand what are, what are those structures that, would, that could bring people together? Um, who are the people who could start to, to connect people and start to develop a strategic engagement? And what would that be centered around? Um, in Sudan, obviously, there's been the, the core problem here is, um, has been lack of leadership. I don't know that I'd talk about Bashir as a leader, maybe an authoritarian or a despot, but um, that, that was the core problem. Uh, but people started organizing around issues related to corruption. Um, and we know from strategic nonviolent organizing that it's, you, you don't pick a large political goal necessarily, and you have to develop tactics that are relatively easy for people to join. Right? Nonviolence works because people of all ages, people of all genders um, can, can join in a way that's relatively safe. And so there has to be something that touches people's lives and around which they can, they can organize themselves. Um, I don't know Eritrea well enough to know what that would look like, but um, I think there's, there's been some really interesting work to see how that type of mobilizing can start to form a foundation for democratic discussion going forward. You know, mm -hmm. in Sudan, people have been talking about the protest um, sit-in as a, a civic university where people are having to learn to work with each other and get to know each other across generations, across genders, across geographies, even across different political ideas. Um, so I'd say it remains to be seen on Eritrea, but mm -hmm. those are some of the building blocks that, mm -hmm. that we've seen in other places. And I think Brahman has been very heavily uh, studying uh, Eritrea and Somalia as well. But um, when it comes to democratic changes that we're seeing uh, or we're hoping to see, uh, do you see any potential for instability, just uh, following up uh, with uh, what Su Susan said, uh, for for getting to see democratic reforms, and is there any danger in uh, too much change too fast uh, in countries that don't have traditional, you know, multi-party uh, democracy? You know, I I think it's important to step back and say first and foremost that the revolution in Ethiopia and the revolution in Sudan could not have happened without social media because that's how everyone organized their protests. And the number one inhibitor in Eritrea is the fact that people don't have access to social media. And so even if there were an inclination to revolt, I'm not sure how they would operationalize it. Um, which means that first and foremost, if you wanna talk about democratic progress um, through protest, you have to talk about economics first. Um, one of the major problems, I think, with external groups um, trying to promote change in Eritrea is that they don't speak the same language as people on the ground. There's a lot of concern about human rights. And I wouldn't say that people in Eritrea don't have concerns about human rights, but the ones who have the most grievances in that regard tend to leave the country. If you've suffered human rights abuses, you basically get out. And the people who remain I think are very unlikely to be activated by that dialogue. On the other hand, economics is a big problem. And the people who are still in the country care about economics. You mentioned a banking crisis. I'll bet any amount of money that there's no one in Washington who can talk about the banking crisis in Eritrea. That's a problem. If you want to make a connection to people on the ground, you have to understand the economics of the situation. And if there is any threat of unrest in Eritrea, in my view, it results from the opening of the border with Ethiopia. Um, there's been strong controls on cash flow in Eritrea. People are not allowed to carry the equivalent of more than a few hundred dollars around at any time. And the opening of the border and the availability of the Ethiopian currency has threatened that, um, that new regime that the Eritreans have been trying to implement. So um, because of that, um, there, there is a possibility for economic-based unrest that we've never seen before. Um, and I would say that's probably why you've seen border closings, for example, to try to, to minimize that risk. Um, that's not to say that people are as unhappy with the Eritrean government as they are thought to be outside the country. Um, but it's definitely to say that there is a tremendous opportunity to collaborate with the Eritrean people and the Eritrean government to create the kind of improvements that might ultimately down the road after the adoption of social media and other forms of normalization lead to positive improvements. Mm -hmm.
So the recurring theme that I'm hearing is economics, uh, human rights, they're all interlinked, and I'd like to come to you, Ambassador James, about the U.S.'s role in this. Uh, the U.S. has had notable programs in the past uh, to help African countries develop economically. Uh, you just mentioned the business forum that was attended by hundreds of people. Um, but in the past, uh, some of the initiatives include the African Growth and Opportunity Act, uh, which offers African businesses access to sell goods uh, in the U.S. market, and Power Africa as well, uh, which promises to increase uh, electrical capacity, maybe so that people could communicate better. Um, and so what, what, what is the U.S., uh, what U.S.-backed programs do you think are making the biggest impact so far on um, the people of the Horn of Africa? Okay, excellent question. Um, I would start first of all by saying that African Growth and Opportunity Act still lives. It's at least slated by legislation to be around until 2025. And the conversation now is already ongoing about what happens post-2025. And we're already thinking about that, and there is some discussion, very preliminary discussion, about maybe a free trade agreement with an African country, looking at maybe making a good model example, and then doing others. So there is talk about what happens at the post-2025. We're not just waiting for it to creep up on us. We're already starting that conversation thinking about it. I don't work in the economic offices, so I'm not the most conversant, but I can assure you that that conversation is going on. Because some countries have done well with the, the AGOA program, not all. Everybody has not used it fully. It's thousands of programs, projects, products rather, and we've only seen um, basically textiles or oil being used for the program, but it has great potential. Um, and you also mentioned Power Africa. I'm very big on Power Africa because electrification is still critical, not just for government day-to-day -day business and for people's day-to-day -day business, but to attract foreign direct investment. FDI really requires dependable supply lines and internet connectivity and all the things that really will move an economy much faster. So Power Africa is still very important. And Power Africa is operating in Ethiopia. They're plussing up their program to take advantage of this new moment that we see on the horizon. So I would still say Power Africa is one of our oldies but goodies. Let's not forget Power Africa, still around. Those of you who talk to your Congress people, keep supporting Power Africa, it's a good one. Um, I'd also say there are other things that we're doing, um, just standard programs before I get to what's new. PEPFAR program, it's a health program, but healthy people are your employees. People are living because of our billions of dollars invested in HIV AIDS and the ARBs that we've been providing and the healthcare capacity building not to be looked at slightly. Nobody else is matching us in how much we've been spending on health in Africa. That's very important. Young people are staying alive. Their children are born HIV AIDS free. It's a big investment for the economy. Um, HIV AIDS takes a huge toll on the most productive sectors, professional people, doctors, teachers, nurses, dying at unacceptable rates. That was a big concern. That really was the wake up call that we had to get in there. So I add our PEPFAR program as part of our economic plan. But then I would also come to another topic which is new, and I'm not the spokesperson for it, but I want to just put it out there for those of you who want to do a little bit more research. One of the things that we have really come to accept and own very aggressively is that we have to bring more private sector money to Africa. That's the long-term solution for jump-starting a lot of economies. The things we're doing with government, we're still doing some of those things, helping them with capacity building, you know, trying to get their interconnectivity right, making um, better road connectivity, restricting you know, working on border and tariff issues. But really, the big game changer will be private sector investment. That's why we had 400 private sector people here for Ethiopia on Friday. But that requires that a lot of fundamentals be put in place, and the deals have to be attractive to governments. We're competing against the Chinas, who do deals very differently. They have state companies that come in. They have very simple financing package. Boom, 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 sign the dotted line. That's not the way American companies work. So we have a new program initiative called Prosper Africa, which is about increasing two-way trade between the United States and Africa. That program will, at its core, provide additional money for things like um, a more expanded OPIC that will provide the guarantees that will allow American businesses to come into risky environments. So this is where we're thinking. We're thinking about how do we get bigger infrastructure projects that US companies can bid on and want to bid on? What do they need to make that environment enticing to them? So we're looking at private sector as really the thing to rev up, because at the end of the day, that's where job creation will happen. It will not happen in more government programs. You need government programs because you've got to have government interface. But really, it's about getting more private sector. And in the United States, we have to work very, very hard. American companies 
are risk averse. They know little about Africa. Um, they are looking for guarantees. They want sanctity of contracts. They want to know the court systems are functioning. And if we can't answer yes on all of those boxes and a doing business indicator is negative, they're not going to come. So we have to make an extra push. So this is what we're talking about now. We have what's called deal teams. We're trying to get our embassies to focus on the whole mission, whole of mission approaches to how do you make a deal happen? Every part of the embassy is being tasked. What do we need to hear from our consular section? What does DOD need to do? What's the foreign commercial section doing? What's the political section doing? Because we want deals to be attractive and we want people to come and say, OK, if I do this, the embassy will back me. We'll have financing from this new BUILD Act, the expanded OPIC, and that Prosper Africa funding will be available. So we're trying to go at this from the private sector approach. That's really where the job creation is going to happen. Well, thank you for that. I think uh, uh, at this point, we're going to be opening it for uh, the audience. Um, if you have any questions for our um, experts here. Uh, it's open for, we're going to be spending the past, I mean, the, the coming 15 minutes, I think, uh, taking questions. Um, uh, we have mics, I think, in two spaces. Anybody who wants to take the first question, um, go ahead. You have to come close to the mic, though. Good afternoon. Paul Sutfin from Sino Resources. Wanted to ask, a number of you have mentioned about the need for regional coordination integration. Do you see this happening through a new institution, through the regional body with the not so great acronym of EGAD, of which Beatrice, I don't think a member, or through the AU, or through informal coordination? Because if you want to have this regional coordination, that's just there's not an obvious path forward. Who would like to take that question? The role of EGOD and, and, and how? I'll take a teeny piece of it and leave <laughs> okay. them some. Okay. Um, one of the things I mentioned was something I just probably glossed over. I talked about our trade hubs. We have long had these hubs in Africa. I think we have about four of them now. And the job of these trade hubs was to promote regional integration. Um, things like trying to work on, on, bar on tariffs that were making it difficult for, for goods to transport. To, to be transported, things that had to do with roads, uh, building better roads so there's better connectivity to get things across markets. So we've always had these trade hubs, not always, we've had them for quite a few decades. The goal now is to use the trade hubs more aggressively through Prosper Africa, as I was describing. So the trade hubs is one way the US government will have a vehicle to help look at what are the regional barriers. Why is it so expensive to get goods from South Africa to Malawi? Why is it so difficult to get goods from Addis to Senegal? I mean, these are the conversations that the trade hubs now expanded under Prosper Africa will be tackling. What are the things we can do to make it more inducive, more conducive to doing inter-Africa travel? So there's that. Um, I'd start with that by saying, you know, that's the US government's part. But there are lots of other bilateral things we're doing. First of all, just helping countries have better capacity to focus on their own um, fundamentals so that people want to invest there and that if a government can be assured they have things in place, then maybe they're more likely to want to trade with their neighbor. So we're trying to do things bilaterally as well as regionally. And I'd say that you know, it's, it's still early days, but this is where the thinking is now. It's about making this integration really work. The US government has some tools, but we're also looking for private sector. We're asking the private sector, what are the obstacles you find? What is it you're concerned about? Banking's a big issue. Foreign currency is a big issue. These are the things that we're trying to have conversations with the governments about bilaterally first and then before we go out regionally. But it's, it's, it's a good project to take on. I wouldn't say it's one that we shy away from. It's a good project, but every country is going to have to be looked at specifically to see what the challenges are. I'll just give you one example of a country that you'd be surprised that we're having so many difficulties with. South Africa, not in our region. South Africa has about 600 or so US companies, about 6,000 Chinese companies. We have a problem even in a country like South Africa, which has a lot of the infrastructure in place. So in East Africa, without their infrastructure, email connectivity, good reliable um, source of energy, these are bigger problems. And so we're really working on those kinds of issues. Um, Ethiopia, a country that we would like to see really take off, they don't have the level of electrification that they need across the country. So these are conversations that we're having, and a lot of it will be driven by what the government prioritizes. Where there's good leadership, we're having a more progressive conversation. Where the leadership is not quite as progressive, it's a slower slog. But you know, we're committed to the private sector 
uh, approach is really the way to go. Yeah, with the EGOT also, there's a contentious uh, relationship. You mentioned Eritrea not being part of EGOT yeah. as well. Right. Uh, maybe, Brownwin, you can uh, chime in here talking about how even within uh, these countries, there are different dynamics. So Djibouti and Eritrea have a different uh, interesting relationship as opposed to Ethiopia. So maybe how does that play out in this uh, regional block? Maybe you can... Yeah, I mean, I think one of, one of the problems with IGAD and why it hasn't been effective is that in, um, a lot of people, myself included, have viewed it primarily as a vehicle for Ethiopia's regional interests. And obviously that's created tensions with Eritrea that have still not been resolved despite the rapprochement between um, Isaias and Abi. Um, Djibouti, too, is, as you've mentioned, Salem, a, a difficult player in this new dispensation in the Horn. Um, Djibouti has benefited tremendously from Eritrea's isolation. It's had a virtual monopoly on ports, and that's important to Djibouti because it's uh, not a democracy, it's an authoritarian regime. And because of its centrality um, in military matters and, of course, um, to Ethiopia's exports, it's gotten a pass on human rights and democratic issues. And that's threatened by the reentry of Eritrea and now Somaliland into the shipping business. Um, and so, in some respects, I think you can call that a zero-sum game. It's unfortunate to use the phrase, uh, but the reality is that Djibouti, obviously, and, and no one really truly likes to see new competition. And so there are genuine hurdles to the kind of regional thinking um, that are going to be difficult to resolve, again, at a time when internally each of the countries of the Horn is struggling with so many different um, problems. So many different layers as well. I remember uh, just recently uh, the Foreign Ministry of Eritrea visiting Somaliland because Somalia was visiting Ethiopia. It's like different dynamics going on and also the Somaliland and Somalia issue is not addressed as well. Maybe if, if any of you could address that or maybe have a conversation about that. I, mean, I just say that if we're talking about regional integration, there's an economic component, component, but there's also a political component to that. So what is the vision and what is the attention and what's the objective? And that is very much unresolved right now amongst those who are members of the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, EGAD, um, and, and across the region. So there has been policy statements saying that there should be more of a tripartite mm -hmm. relationship between Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Somalia, but without a clear vision about what that looks like and why and how you get there and how Kenya um, and all of the other neighbors, including Somaliland, would feel about that plan. Um, obviously, at the continental level, you have the African Continental Free Trade Agreement that provides a frame, um, and countries are actually signing on to this and ratifying in a serious way. Um, but translating that into the different areas of cooperation, I think, is, goes back to how, how do you put in place um, the infrastructure. Um, I think in, in all of these circumstances, when talking about the politics, if there's going to be a way to manage um, the transitions across the horn, and the engagement of the Gulf and other powers, it's likely to take multiple and overlapping multilateral institutions. If we look at other examples where there has been cooperation on, on trade or managing um, maritime security, um, if you look at the Baltic Sea, I mean, these all take various different initiatives over various different times to respond to the needs as they evolve. And it sounds a little bit like platitudes, but we, we seem to keep looking for one institution that's going to work. And, and that's very difficult in any circumstance. And at a time when everything is up in the air, you know, this is, people have described this um, change as similar to 1989 in Eastern Europe, what's, mm. what is happening in the Horn. Um, this isn't just a couple of countries that are going through small transitions. Um, so so I'd, I'd urge that we think about this as not having one, one answer. Everything, uh, a little info, shout out to USIP. Um, this year, like basically about a month ago, there was a Red Sea Dialogue um, co-hosted with USIP, um, NISA, and um, Africa St Center at the uh, NDU. It was a really good conversation because this whole idea of integration, it starts with the companies coming together who have a common maritime security concern. That was the first topic, probably the easiest one to start with. There are lots of other forms of integration or not that are happening in the region. But looking at the Red Sea as an entire region where there are concerns on both sides of the, of the sea and where the, the countries um, have some common ground to focus on security issues was a good starting place. That helps to unify the region too. So that's an initiative the State Department's a part of. We think it's useful. 
Um, it's, it may get harder as we start going on to other topics, mm -hmm. but that's very important that we have multiple, as you say, multiple fora to have this conversation. EGAD alone will never unify the whole region. Um, I don't think that was ever its, agen its agenda at its inception, and certainly now it's very problematic. But having different fora that we can come together, as long as we're inclusive, I think it's, it's, it's good that we have many different opportunities. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Howdy there. Hello. Yes. First off, thank you all for a, for a very wonderful discussion. Um, so I'm more of a Arabian Peninsula Yemen guy, and I'm really liking how you guys are talking about um, sort of trans-regional dynamics and the need to consider those. I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about sort of trans-regional migration dynamics um, and how Horn of Africa countries are responding to those, particularly in light of, in recent weeks, um, security forces in Yemen detaining something like five to 6,000 um, irregular migrants, and yeah, just want to inject that into the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, so migrants uh, moving through the region all the way to Yemen. In fact, we've covered this very extensively. And every time, even when you see all that war going on in Yemen, you still see uh, rickety boats sh uh, sinking on the way on the route to uh, Yemen. Um, maybe this is a humanitarian aspect of it. Any uh, thoughts on that, Youssef? Uh, I, I think I, I would like to go back to the, the, the governance deficit that is driving this uh, uh, humanitarian mi mi migration issues. I think uh, uh, addressing uh, the internal dynamics, particularly the, the uh, one, the, the disuse belt, particularly in countries like Ethiopia, where uh, there is a massive expectation of use. Uh, in terms of gaining uh, employment, particularly a lot of them being uh, or having that feeling that is they are uh, a part of uh, this solution in terms of bringing about the changes uh, that we have been witnessing, in, in fact, being in the forefront of uh, driving uh, these changes. Uh, but I think also conflicts that are causing people to leave their, their homes uh, and uh, in some cases moving in, within countries, but uh, most importantly, uh, crossing borders and causing uh, this huge migration uh, crisis that we see uh, frequently uh, both capsizing uh, uh, and a, a lot of young people from Ethiopia, from Somalia and Eritrea dying uh, at, as a result of that. I, I, I think that there is, I don't think there is going to be a single kind of uh, recommendation for that, but for me addressing the key uh, governance problems that's driving uh, these uh, young people to leave uh, their homes uh, is a, 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 a critical. Mm -hmm. If any of you uh, would like to chime in, I think we're uh, <laughs> leading into our second block of the conversation. Um, but uh, that concludes the first block. Uh, thank you so much for our panelists for a very insightful uh, discussion. Um, and that's it for me. Yeah. Yeah, please. Uh